Tony hadn't been up this early in, well, technically ever. There'd been a few times in college when he had still been up at 4 a.m. on a Sunday, but that was a completely different thing from actually getting out of bed at this hour. He was walking down the hall in the dark and he tripped over something that wasn't even there. And he had to try twice to get a grip on the doorknob to Shane's room. He opened it and mumbled something into the darkness and Shane mumbled something back. And Tony headed back down the hall to the bathroom. What had he been thinking? Why had this seemed like a good idea? He was aware of having that, that half asleep tunnel vision where you have no peripheral vision yet. And it occurred to him that if an ax murderer was gonna to choose today to hide behind the shower curtain, this would be the day. So he opened the curtain just to double check. And you know, he was fine because even the ax murderers are still in bed. Everybody was still in bed, except apparently for fishermen. Going fishing had sounded like fun. It sounded good right up until bedtime last night. Just, you know, not right at the moment. When he came out of the bathroom, he tripped again, only this time over Shane, who was sitting on the floor waiting. Shane grunted at him and Tony grunted back and then went to make the coffee and get dressed. Artie was gonna to come to pick them up pretty soon and then they would drive down the block to pick up Walt and Pico. The lake was a 45 minute drive. They'd get there just in time for sunrise, Artie said. It was the best time, Artie said. Don't even pack a lunch, we'll catch enough fish, Artie said. Tony wasn't still quite sure what to make of Artie. Shane liked him, but Shane liked everybody, and Walt liked him, which carried more weight. I mean, Walt liked everybody too, but Walt didn't necessarily trust everybody, and he did seem to trust Artie. They were a funny pair, Artie and Walt, the tattooed hippie and the retired Anglican priest. They'd met at the animal shelter when Walt was there to adopt Pico. And since then, Tony had seen Artie's uh, aging crew cab truck in Walt's driveway a few times. Walt said that he was teaching Artie how to tie a bow tie and Artie was teaching him how to be groovy. And he had laughed so hard, he had to sit down whatever the fishing trip was a good idea especially for shane right now he'd been pretty shaken up by what happened at the animal shelter when pico's former abusive and angry owner had showed up and artie and shane had had to deal with him until the cops got there They'd both given statements and somewhere in a file in the police station there was a photograph of Shane's bruised knees and skinned hands. He'd gone from scared to angry pretty quickly and he was still a bit angry, understandably, but Walt was sort of talking him through it. Tony had the coffee started and he looked out the window and he thought that he really, really, really hoped that Artie would not pull in the driveway and honk. Down the street, Walt was finishing his breakfast. He was up and dressed, except for his tie, just in case of spills. The older he got, the, uh, the earlier he found himself awake. And Besides, he had decades of getting up early on Sunday mornings to, uh, to pray and to go over his sermon and think things through. Sundays had always been a busy day. He'd certainly never gone fishing on a Sunday morning. He kind of smiled, you know, imagining what that would have looked like. 
he looked down at Pico and he said out loud, I won't be here next week, Mrs. Abernathy. I'm going fishing and I've invited God to come with me, so you might not want to count on him either. He laughed and scratched Pico's ears. He was laughing more the last few weeks. When he'd lost Esther, he'd sort of forgotten how for a while. Maybe Pico was good for him. Maybe he was healing. It was good having young Shane and his dad in his life, and he really hoped he was giving them back as much as they were giving him, even if all he had to give was listening. Right now, Shane was trying to figure out how, well, whether to forgive, to forgive the man who had abused Pico so badly. You're supposed to forgive people, but what if they don't deserve it? What if they don't even want it? What if they won't even admit that they've done something wrong? That was a tough question. Walt didn't even try to answer it. He just told stories. Like the story of Gladys and Tim. Gladys had been a parishioner for, oh, a good 20 years. She was a widow and she didn't have a lot, uh, just her house and things that reminded her of the things that she used to have. Tim was a kid, good at heart, like most, but He'd made some bad friends, and one night they'd got into somebody's dad's beer and thrown a brick through Gladys's window. Tim was caught. The others got away. But Gladys had forgiven Tim. And she'd made a deal where he'd work for her after school for, you know, a while every day to pay her back for the window repairs. But more than that, she loved that boy. She made him cookies and lemonade and she got him talking. She introduced herself to his mom and tried to be a good friend. She showed Tim her husband's Civil War coin collection, dumping them out of their little tin box onto the kitchen table and telling him the little that she knew about them. Hours and hours of love. And Tim started to come around. The, the edge started to soften and he talked more easily. Then one day she had caught him with the box of coins passing it out the window to another boy. She caught them by surprise and they both let go of the box at the same time and it fell in the grass outside with the coins scattering. The other boy ran away. She didn't yell at Tim. She didn't kick him out. She just sent him outside to gather up the coins, put them back in the box. And when he came back, she was sitting at the kitchen table with cookies and lemonade. They had a long talk. He said he was sorry and she forgave him again and they started again. The little tin box went back on its shelf. A month or so later, there were a couple of days when Tim didn't show up after school. So Gladys phoned his mom who just said, yeah, he's not here. Yeah, I'll tell him. For the rest of that week, Gladys refused to look at the little tin box, refused to pick it up. She did not want to open it. She did not want to pick it up and discover that it was empty. But eventually she did. And it was. She never saw Tim again. She told Walt later that 
she could forgive Tim for breaking her windows. She could forgive him for stealing from her once, for stealing from her twice. But she could not, she could not forgive him for never coming back. She couldn't forgive him for not forgiving himself. Forgiveness is complicated and it's hard work more often than not. Hard to give, harder to accept. There were no easy answers then for Gladys and there were none now for Shane. But Walt always found that it did help to know that you were not the only one. So he'd keep on listening. He'd keep on telling his stories and watching for that light that comes on behind the eyes every once in a while. That was Walt's gift. That was what he had to give. He had received so much. He had been forgiven so much. He had a lifetime's stockpile of grace and he would be giving it away with both hands for as long as the Lord allowed him. Listening, not judging. Seeing the best in everyone. Seeing their mistakes, but not condemning. It wasn't a bad way to live for an old guy. <laughs> he picked up his tie off the kitchen table it was bright green with a hand-painted trout, a rainbow trout. Tied it in a perfect Windsor knot, clipped the leash to Pico's collar just in time to hear a horn honking down the street. <laughs> he said to Pico, we're going to have to ask the neighbors to forgive us, aren't we, girl? Yes, we are. <laughs>